transcendental universal doctrine of regeneration and redemption. Similar changes were occurring in Persian metaphysics, and we find the roots appearing also in Greek speculation. For about the beginning of the Christian era, the simple philosophic clarity of Plato's thinking became involved in the highly mystical speculations of the Neoplatonists and the Neopythagoreans, seated in that melting pot of commerce and culture, the ancient North African city of Alexandria. Also in this same time, cross groups began to emerge, mingling Greek thought with thinking of Christianity and producing such peculiar uh, groups as the Gnostics and the followers of Manes, the Manichaean group. In all of these instances, one simple point stands out. The gradual transformation of older doctrines into highly mystical revelations. Revelations that had one essential purpose behind them, and that was to change the concept of the transcendence of deity to the concept of the immanence of deity. This is a very important philosophical point. The mysterious God of old, or the godlings of ancient times, living in their remote Olympian or Samurian heights, uh, were a race of beings apart, inhabitants of heaven. But in this gradual change that took place, Deity was transformed into an eternal power, everywhere present, always invisible, beyond definition, yet immediately available through certain transcendent achievements of human consciousness. We know that this change marked not only uh, the shift in the psychological integration of the Mediterranean region, but that it swept across the world. There are even vestiges of this change occurring in the Western Hemisphere among the primitive peoples, perhaps not so primitive peoples, of Central America. We find a gradual tendency to associate the rise of religious mysticism among the Mayas at a time approximating the beginning of the Christian era. This phenomenon was so remarkable that Lord Kingsborough, one of the greatest 19th century authorities on Central American culture, felt that it was almost certain that the mysterious deity Quetzalcoatl, the feathered serpent, who came so strangely to Mexico, must have been one of the original apostles. In other words, there seemed no other way of explaining this, because there was no common communication between these peoples. Yet at almost one time, they all came to an almost identical conclusion, changed their entire religious course, and transformed the structure of religion from its archaic form to the type of religious understanding which we share and enjoy today. Now this obviously opens a very large area of speculation. There are many possible explanations, some rather impossible, which have still held a measure of favor. One broadly accepted uh, doctrine relating to this, or explanation for the circumstances, is the idea of coincidental emergence. We have parallels of this in simpler ways. We fre frequently hear, for example, of an invention 
that has been offered to the world. And it is not uncommon that the same invention shall appear in, the, in different places at the same time. Several persons coming to almost identical conclusion and at almost the identical moment. Therefore, the coincidence concept is not quite as loose as might first appear, for it is based upon the assumption that time is measured by a series of events, and that whenever a culture or a group of persons or a civilization passes through certain experiences, there are corresponding innovations in that culture, changes in its doctrines and beliefs. Perhaps the interval of 600 years between the advent of the great teachers and the beginning of the Christian era brought several nations or several culture groups to almost the same psychological platform. And there was no direction in which they could go except that direction which is most natural and common to human nature. Another explanation which requires perhaps a little more investigation is the concept that these changes were tied together, that actually there was greater commerce between these ancient cultures than we at this time assume to have existed that it is quite possible that by the beginning of the Christian era a degree of world thought had been established, particularly along the caravan routes. And it is interesting that most of these innovations rose in regions along the caravan lines between Europe and Asia. Therefore, it is conceivable that Asiatics did visit uh, Western centers of learning. It is also quite possible that more Europeans visited Asia than we now realize. We know that Pythagoras was able in the 6th century BC to reach India. We know that the armies of Alexander the Great penetrated Asia. We do not know just how largely these motions contributed to world ideas. But one thing we can generally regard as undeniable, that the world of cultured, civilized nations came to about the same ideas at almost the same time. Of course, to the uh, devout transcendentalist or metaphysician, there is no problem at all. All these things are handled by invisible forces beyond human comprehension. Uh, we do not deny such a possibility, but we also like to see, if possible, some uh, more simple and explainable procedure. Uh, these transcendental solutions belong to the divine emergencies, and I would rather see First, if we cannot find some common ground for assuming that these changes were made by at least partially natural means. And I think we can rather well establish this. Now, you may wonder why all this has a bearing upon the Kabbalah and the doctrines of the early Jewish peoples. The importance lies in this very circumstance, namely, that Kabbalism is perhaps the broadest term that we have for Jewish transcendentalism. Kabbalism is to the old Orthodox Jewish belief almost in the same relationship as Mahayana Buddhism to primitive Buddhism in India or the theological Taoism to the primitive absolutism of Lao Tse. In each instance, we see the arising of a new point of view, 
and in